just a few words, this is a non for L1 for the ox is a non for profit organization fundamentally dependent on your patronage. So there would be a basket circulating, please do your name. And if you want to volunteer, uh, there is a, a list by the door, sign up and put your emails on the list as well. Thank you, Arno, I'm a pay market book. Uh, we're really glad that all of you could come out tonight. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things besides turning off your cell phones, which we really would appreciate. <laughs> People are recording tonight, so just be mindful of that. Uh, particularly if later on in the Q&A you want to make comments, uh, they'll be recorded uh, unless you um, talk to us afterwards. I'm going to say nothing to uh, introduce uh, Elon other than just to say what a pleasure uh, it is for us to have him here in the country. His work has really uh, been so transformative, so important. We're really privileged to publish him, to have him here. Uh, he's going to speak for around 45 minutes, uh, and then I'll come up and help moderate or immoderate uh, a short discussion uh, with you. Uh, and then he'll be glad to stick around and sign copies of your books, uh, assuming you purchase them, and, um, and then uh, continue the conversation from there. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I uh, had to put with me the last three days, and he's done a great job. And uh, I want to thank Alwan for uh, hosting this event. Uh, I rarely speak in New York. I think it's only the second time in uh, a short lifespan that I ever spoke here. So, uh, the microphone. Sorry, I was anyway. Didn't say anything important. Uh, it was mainly thanks to Alwan, which is the important thing. Uh, um, what I would like to do uh, in the 45 minutes is to, first of all, give a very short background uh, for the book, uh, which is the main cause for this event, uh, Gaza in Crisis, the, that I co-authored uh, with Noam Chomsky, a and then uh, use some of the main chapters in this book to make a larger point about the kind of discussion which I think is not only taking place between Noam Chomsky and myself, but which is taking place between various components of the solidarity movement with the Palestinian people, including within the Palestinian uh, politics, uh, or polity, so to speak. And, and these are very uh, uh, crucial issues, I think. Uh, um, one of the reasons we decided to write a book about uh, an internal debate between uh, two people who, for a very long time, support the Palestine issue uh, was to have a friendly debate between two people who disagree about almost uh, uh, everything that has to do today with a grand picture which is called the Palestine uh, issue and yet have a lot of common ground uh, and I think that's a typical situation uh, we are all in in it uh, and I, I'm not sure as I'm less aware about the scene in the United States so I don't know how much it is uh, relevant to what goes on here but definitely coming from Europe, I'm very much aware that there is an internal debate uh, about uh, these issues. Uh, and again, the debate reflects a larger problem of uh, fragmentation, disunity, and uh, sometimes loss of orientation within the Palestinian national movement in general. And that, that happens often, by the way, that the solidarity movement echoes problems within the movement it wants to support. Uh, and uh, I think we wanted to push forward a dialogue, at least in the solidarity movement, uh, because the agency is for the Palestinians themselves, of course, to solve the problem of this unity and fragmentation. Nobody can do it uh, for themselves, but we hope to have a more positive impact on that kind of a, of a debate. Um, and, and that was the background uh, for, the, uh, for the book, because uh, we felt it represent, we represented more than ourselves. And if it was just the two of us, I don't think it would have been important enough. But we, we felt that uh, uh, three or four issues uh, that we decided to uh, discuss jointly are three or four issues which uh, uh, concern the solidarity movement with the Palestinians uh, in general. So let me just uh, uh, do the following. Talk about these three and four issues. I'm not going to... Uh, move from one side of the table to the other and say, now I'm Noam and then I'm Elan. Uh, um, you'll have to read Noam's position in the book. I mean, that's what I promised the publishers anyway. 
that I will try and help and sell, sell the book. So I'm giving you only half of the book. <laughs> if you don't buy it, you, you, you are going to be a bit frustrated because you're going to see half of the film, uh, and that's not good enough. The, um, the first issue that we, uh, and that really was an, an old debate between us that also opens the book, is an attempt to understand what lies behind the American support for Israel. It's not that many of us do not know the answer to this question. I'm sure many of you in this room, especially here in New York, if I ask you uh, to come to a class of, of mine in the university and tell the students why do you think the United, the United States supports Israel, or why is it important to understand why the United States support Israel, I don't think you'll have a problem of doing that. So there isn't any, uh, despite of WikiLeaks, there isn't any new material uh, that we didn't know before. I mean, it's not like a, a kind of a difficult uh, uh, um, code that you have to decipher. I think it's quite easy. However, it's interesting that since the publication of John Mirschmeyer and Stephen Wold's book about APAC, we are debating, and it's good that we are debating, uh, the questions of the innuendos on the focuses of American policy, rather than the big picture. I mean, the big picture, in a way, I think is clear. And I think for activists, less than for academics, for activists to understand which constitutive element in American policy is more important than the other is crucial. It's crucial. Uh, you can either be very defeatist and say the crucial elements are so powerful that if you, we are just ordinary citizens, we'll have to take it for granted that this kind of policy would continue and there's very little we can do, either as citizens or as members of the civil society. However, if you think that there are different constitutive elements and, and mainly some that could be uh, challenged from bottom up or by people who do not necessarily belong to the political elite, that makes a change for the kind of agenda that you develop, especially among the Arab American community, the Palestinian American community, and the progressive uh, circles in this country uh, uh, who are committed and interested in the Palestine question. My own take uh, in this uh, book is that um, as a historian, I think uh, the American support for, for Palestine uh, and the American support for Israel have fluctuated throughout the years in a way that actually shows that it's very, it would be very wrong to ad adopt a determinist approach for the future. So what I try to do, very different from what Noam does in the book, I try to highlight the chapters and the junctures in history where actually the American impulse as an establishment, as a regime, was to support the Palestine issue rather than to negate it. And I believe that highlighting these chapters in history uh, are important for anyone who takes a bit of a simplistic and reductionist view of American policy towards Israel uh, today. And I will just mention uh, briefly uh, two of many points that are the, or, or historical junctures that, that I mentioned there. Uh, one, one, one juncture is uh, the um, American uh, support uh, or the, the basic American impulse or positive impulse on the Palestine issue in uh, the 1950s, the early 1950s, during the days of the Dwight Eisenhower uh, administration. Uh, Eisenhower's administration in the collective Arab memory is a very, uh, plays a very negative role. After all, this is the administration that uh, put forward a containment strategy and, and uh, struggled very harshly and very ruthlessly against uh, progressive Arab uh, leaders and, and regimes. And, and the feeling was that actually they sort of uh, I imported into the Middle East the Cold War uh, in the times of Eisenhower. But he was very different on Palestine for some bizarre reason. It's very interesting. He and his Secretary of State, John Foster Dallas, um, were not convinced uh, that, A, there was a justification for a Jewish state. They thought that Arabs and Jews could share the land. Nor were they convinced by the Israeli arguments against the right of the refugees to return. Now, you have to remember, 50, 1952 and 1953, the idea that the refugees are, can return seemed quite plausible because their houses, in some cases, were still there. The villages were still there and uh, the refugees themselves were living in very temporary conditions 
So that uh, this did not seem strange unless you were totally convinced by the Zionist ideology that the return undermines the Jewish de demographic majority uh, in the state. And neither Dallas nor Eisenhower were convinced that this was the case. And, and this is the background for the foundation of APAC which was the brainchild of the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations in the 1950s, uh, Abba Ibn, who was very worried about this uh, uh, shift in American, uh, uh, in American position. And together with some people who worked in the United Nations uh, press office, who were supporters of Zionism, they created uh, the, the first uh, nucleus uh, and, and sort of cohort of people that eventually uh, uh, brought to the world the pro-Israeli uh, lobby. So the pro-Israeli lobby actually was needed because apparently, even as high up as the White House, sometimes there are people with an impulse to support the Palestinians rather than the Israelis. And, and that was something that Abba Ibn was very worried about. He thought if the president can speak about refugees and Palestinians, who knows uh, uh, what, who else could join him. And, 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 and I think that's an important lesson to learn. And I think rather than focusing on the debate that uh, Chomsky had with, for, insta for instance, with Mirschmeyer, Mirschmeyer and Walt, whether APAC is or is not very important, it's far more important to my mind to study why APAC came into being, and not in a simplistic way, to understand exactly why Israel was doing that. Um, another uh, uh, chapter which, which is quite uh, uh, interesting uh, deals less with, with the administration, but, but with a very complex relationship between Christian Zionism and uh, the State of Israel. And, and I thought it was important also to highlight that chapter because as probably many of you know, uh, Christian Zionism was not a very pro-Zionist movement to begin with. And that's definitely not a pro-Israeli movement. And, and they were not allowed to have annual conferences in Israel uh, until uh, another United Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Benjamin Netanyahu, said, why not? Let's invite them to have annual conferences in Jerusalem and uh, let's have uh, an unholy alliance with these people. Because, of course, the, the divine scheme that they believe in, as you know, uh, is partly Zionist and partly is very anti-Semitic. Uh, uh, the, the Zionist part is that the return of the Jews to the Holy Land precipitates the second coming of the Messiah. The second part is that, in that case, the Jews would have to convert to Christianity or be shish kebab in hell. <laughs> and uh, the barbecue in hell somehow uh, was forgotten in the 1990s. Uh, uh, and these people with these little scenarios of Jews on, on the mangal on the, on, the on, on the barbecue stands, uh, uh, is th doesn't bother anyone because of their political power and, and uh, uh, impact in the United States. So. Um, the difference, I think, in the stresses between us is that I do think that it's time to divorce the Palestine issue from the general picture of American imperialism or the fight against imper American imperialism or that the Palestinians should wait for the big international socialist revolution. Uh, I think we should focus for the sake of the urgency of saving the Palestinians or something more confined. It's not very revolutionary, it's not very ethical maybe, but it's the only thing that would save the Palestinians. I remember the days in London where the only people who were admitted to a solidarity meeting with the Palestinians had to look uh, so radical that I think even Che Guevara would have been considered a lawyer for Wall Street and would not have been admitted. So I, I think there, there's time to, to focus on this. The second uh, issue is uh, no less important, and I think this has to do with how do you view the essence of the conflict between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians? And it has to do with the paradigm of peace, so to speak. Um, many of us uh, were convinced that, uh, for many years, that the idea of partition as a principle is a good, is a good idea. That uh, the two-state solution is the mantra that eventually would uh, produce uh, uh, a feasible peace on the ground. Um, and uh, for that matter, accepted that in order to push forward an effective peace process, you have to focus on the fate 
of the territories that Israel had occupied in June 1967. And then, of course, you, you define yourself as being pro-peace or against peace according to how far are you willing to go with uh, creating a situation in which Israel fully withdraws from the areas it had occupied in, June, in the June 67 war, and how independent and how sovereign would be the Palestinian uh, polity that, or political outfit that would emerge instead of the Israeli rule. And, and uh, I try to argue in the book that this was always a wrong approach, and definitely today it's the wrong approach. And I'm trying to uh, ask, actually, uh, uh, to get away from the tendency in the um, peace uh, process industry on the one hand, but also among peace activists on the other, from the attempt to shrink the issue of Palestine geographically and demographically. Namely, uh, uh, to focus on the fate of the people who live under, education, uh, under occupation for the last uh, 42 years and to say this is Palestine and this is the issue of Palestine. It's not surprising, by the way, that the Palestinians who live under occupation were the main pushers and main motivating force for us to focus on the fate of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip as the fate of Palestine or as the issue of the conflict, but I think it is wrong. And, and the way I try to tackle this is by claiming that a very important part in uh, reducing the issue of Palestine geographically to the mere 20% of the land and to a very small number of Palestinians, excluding the Palestinians in Israel, excluding the Palestinians in the refugee camps, in the uh, exilic communities, I think that the main, that the, one of the main reasons is a very successful Israeli campaign for denying the Nakba, for denying what happened in 1948. And I try to show in the book the history of denial in Israel uh, uh, of the events of 1948. And I try also to show the shift in my own understanding of that denial. When, when I wrote first about this denial, I thought that the Israeli inclination to and reluctance to uh, open this Pandora box and, and admit the kind of criminal policies that they have pursued in, in 1948, which I call in my book the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. I thought that the main uh, reason for this Israeli uh, reluctance was, and I was hopeful in those days, was that they felt bad about what, what they had done yeah. in 1948. <laughs> I think I was wrong. Uh, I, I don't think that was the problem, but I really believed it was a problem. Uh, I was in, influenced by my own family and by people I knew who were part in 48 and I thought what I sense there is is a shame is is a, definitely they know what they had done uh, more or less Jewish soldiers uh, three years after the Holocaust behaved in a way which was not that different from, from the way that the Nazis behaved and and that was something that they, I said to myself of course how can they how can they sort of put it forward and 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 discuss it openly and freely that doesn't psychologically doesn't make any sense but I think that is not the reason I, I think the reason is that uh, 1948 uh, was the ultimate Zionist uh, solution for the most basic mismatch that the Zionist movement uh, represents. The mismatch between a genuine wish to create a democratic or a liberal democratic or socialist democratic, it doesn't matter, but democratic, the stress is on a democratic state namely one which is ruled by the and governed by the rule of the majority and represents any developments in liberal democracy, uh, liberal democratic regimes uh, in the West, on the one hand, and the fact that this has to be always and forever a Jewish majority. I mean, the, 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 the books on democracy that they have written has this bizarre idea that democratic majority is valid only if it is ethnically uh, uh, valid as well, or, or religiously valid as well. Namely, only a majority of Jews constitute a, major, a democratic majority. Um, and it takes time for Israelis who are born into the system to understand this fallacy and this uh, very bizarre way of explaining democratic values. And uh, I don't think the political science department in Israel are doing a very good job in <laughs> explaining that because they have this general introductions about what democracy is, and then they teach about the Israeli democracy. And I think the two 
have nothing in common in this respect. But nonetheless, I think 1948 was the mismatch, was the, the solution for the mismatch. Namely, if you have a real problem with numbers, and they had the real problems in numbers, either under the map that Israel was given in the partition resolution in November 47, or according to their own map in March 1948, when they decided that apart from what today is the West Bank and the Gaza Strip would be the future state. In both these geographical spaces, the Jews were a minority. And they had to decide, how do you create a Jewish majority when the Jews are a minority? And the very clear answer they gave was to kick out the Palestinians. And in the process to destroy half of Palestine's villages, half of Palestine's towns, uh, massacre thousands of Palestinians in order to make the point, uh, but that, that's, that, that was the motive. And I think that the denial of that is not shame. It's not a reluctance to face your unpleasant chapters. And it happens in national history where you uh, uh, rather go for the gratifying chapters in your history and you sort of put aside the more uh, uh, unpleasant ones. No, I, I think that was uh, the idea that the way you solve this mismatch should not be discussed. This is classical labor Zionism. You don't discuss these things. You do them. They were always annoyed by the revisionist movement in Israel because they have a tendency to explain what they're doing and discuss it. And the labor movement does not believe in it. It believes in doing it. It's, it's better to colonize the West Bank than to talk about greater Eretz Israel ideology. It works better. Uh, uh, and, and it's not surprising that the present Israeli government is the best uh, 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 sort of ambassadors uh, for the Palestine cause because they talk openly about what anyway Israeli governments were doing before and they want even to legislate <coughs> de facto practices against Palestinians in Israel because they need to explain, they need to, to show that this is legitimate and so on. And this was never, I think, the modern operandi of the Zionist uh, movement. So, so the, the idea of, of not uh, dealing with 1948 has to do with not opening up the basic immoral uh, 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 foundation of the Jewish state. And I think that the Jewish state is based on an immoral foundation, and we have a problem with that. Now, um, therefore, I argue in the book, and I don't think Noam totally agrees with it, but that doesn't matter. Uh, uh, I, I argue that we have to open up the question of the ideology of the Jewish state and highlight it as the main obstacle for peace. Not the Israeli policies, not the Israeli strategies, but the Israeli ideology. Very much like apartheid as an ideology was the barrier for reconciliation in South Africa. Uh, and and uh, I, I really believe that this requires all kinds of changes in the dictionary that we use. I think we should re-enter the, into the dictionary the words colonialism. And we should get used to the idea that if even Muslims, even some radical Muslims can be anti-colonialists. I know it's difficult, but un even, even, even uh, women with hijab and men with beards, uh, well, even Che Guevara had a beard, can be anti-colonialists. Uh, anti and, and I think that we have to go back to colonialism and anti-colonialism in order to have the analysis, but also the prognosis for the uh, Palestine uh, issue. Another point of, of uh, discussion is about the uh, uh, boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, the BDS. I think we have a very open, and I ha I'm happy we have an open discussion because, uh, um, as you know, this discussion has eroded somewhat the unity of the solidarity movement, uh, the idea of the boycott, especially the cultural boycott, and in particular, the academic boycott of Israel. Um, uh, it, it causes, and, and again, I'm speaking uh, from the viewpoint of Europe, so I'm not sure how much I reflect similar problems in the, in the United States. But definitely in Europe, uh, this is an issue that uh, can divide people, despite the fact that everybody wants to be in the same uh, solidarity uh, movement. Uh, I, I put a, a case there, I hope strong enough, uh, with a very little reservation about my total support for this uh, idea, that Israel should be made uh, into a pariah state. I think it's a rogue state, and rogue states should be made into pariah states. And I think uh, you don't have to invent the wheel. I think that... 
I, th I think that uh, we have in the past uh, uh, seen societies uh, recruit them, the, the resources, even when the governments were reluctant to, s to send this message very clearly to another rogue state, the apartheid South African state. However, saying that, I also say, and I try to, to explain that this uh, by itself is not enough. It's very easy to sort of articulate this uh, idea in a soundbite form. It's far more difficult uh, to practice it because practicing it is, is a very complex issue where you have to make sure that you uh, don't uh, uh, alienate the people you want to engage with, uh, uh, that you don't want to replace an idea which is basically a tactics with a vision. The vision is not a boycott state, right? The boycott is supposed to create something better. And I think we have still a very long way to go, but uh, I must say, and again coming from Europe, I am so impressed by the effect, especially of the idea of the cultural boycott and the academic boycott, on uh, the uh, support for the Palestine issue in Europe. It turned out to be the most accessible, effective, and galvanizing idea that I have seen in the case of Palestine. And there's very little you can say against it if it is articulated in the right way and when it is exercised uh, in the right way. And uh, since we have a very clear call from the Palestinian society under occupation for such a boycott to take place, I think there is even more of a moral validity. And, and I do hope that this idea would be grounded also in the activity here in the United States. I think that uh, sending the message from here to anyone who represents uh, an establishment in Israel, an official Israeli uh, uh, organization, they should have very difficult life of coming here, performing here, and feeling good here. And I think this is something we all can perform either individually or collectively without that much effort. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, should be at least our contribution while we wait for the Palestinian uh, community to do their own contribution, which is to get over the uh, fragmentation, which was the inevitable consequence and the object of the Zionist colonization of Palestine. So it's not surprising that this fragmentation is almost an integral part of the Palestinian existence. Nonetheless, uh, no one can do it for them, for them uh, in this uh, respect. Uh, I think uh, Noam Chomsky puts quite reasonable and very forceful counter argument, uh, with which I don't agree. Uh, but I think it's worth, it's very important, and I hope we are, we are conveying the message in the book, that the dialogue can continue without necessarily undermining at least the unity of the solidarity uh, movement uh, on an issue that I think, uh, as, as I end my article with, I say that in the end of the day as an activist, you have to say yes or no. But that doesn't mean that you haven't undergone a very uh, winding and very complex road before you got to the bottom line and said this is the right uh, strategy. Um, we have two more issues, and I don't know how much more time we have. We have two more issues. W one is, uh, and I must admit, and, and I'm trying to be very economical here because Norm is not here, and it's, I don't want to uh, at all address it, but the only position of Norm I don't understand in the book, the, the others I understand, I do accept or not, is his position on the refugee issue. Um, and for me, it's, dif it's different because from all the issues I'm discussing with you tonight and all the issues that we raise in the book, the one issue where I have very little inhibition, where I have very little reservation, is the issue of the Palestinians' right of return. Uh, maybe because uh, this was the focus of my activity when I still lived in Israel, and this, I thought, would be my main contribution as an academic as well, at least to, to, to explain why, at least in principle, there should be no doubt that the refugees and uh, uh, subsequent generations of refugees would have an unconditional right to return. That doesn't mean that I know exactly how practical this is and how exactly do we, we solve it uh, on the ground. I'm, I'm not the leader of a political movement. I don't think it's even my role to, to, to do this. But, but at least as a human impulse, as a decent human impulse, I, I, I see no other way than to say that people who were victims of a cruel and ruthless ethnic cleansing operation have the right 
even if they don't have the ability to come back. And um, I think that as, as much as I think that Zionism is the main barrier for peace, I think that without an equitable solution that would allow this return, uh, any other issue of uh, uh, outstanding between Israel and the Palestinians would be meaningless if this issue would not be uh, engaged with and tackled in, in an effective uh, way. But it's, it's important to say that uh, uh, this, this issue is not that easily uh, accepted by, by everyone. And, and very rarely, and I think uh, to our credit, if I may say so in the book, very rarely these issues are dealt beyond slogans. Uh, uh, people say we are for it, we're against it. I think what we try to do in the book is to give some some meat, if you want, to sort of provide some meat on the skeleton of our arguments, to, to, to thicken it with, with uh, data, with, with uh, comparative studies and so on, to, to, to allow people to enter the debate in a more informed way and not just an emotional way about uh, whether people have the right or don't have the right. And finally, uh, we, we tackle the issue that, at least in Europe and I know also inside Israel, uh, is very uh, important and relates directly to all these issues. It's the, what we call in Europe the one status against the two status. Uh, um, as if tomorrow we, in the Solidarity Movement and the Palestinian Movement, we have uh, an urgent call tonight to uh, compose the, the government that, uh, that would take over the, the regime that we have toppled uh, in Israel. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's good to think that way, uh, uh, that you may uh, be able to change the regime there and that you have, each one of us have, have a, has a duty to say, okay, we know the regime we don't want, what is the regime we want? That, that's a fair question that activists should ask themselves. Uh, the heat of the debate is a bit bizarre to me because, uh, as I say, uh, unless I miss something, around the corner this change of regime is not waiting and unlike some other changes of regime that happen in the Middle East, nobody seems to be willing to use military force to change that uh, regime. Um, however, I do think this is a very crucial and interesting uh, issue to, to, to engage with. I mean, the one state and the two state solution. And uh, um, I, I try to put uh, uh, a kind of a case for the one state uh, solution based mainly on on this idea of a change of regime rather than on the idea that you have to define exactly the common republican good or the constitutional uh, infrastructure for a joint state or any other project that would have to take place if you want to think about a different political outfit that would serve the people who, was, who were there. I, I'm talking about the change of regime because I think that the basis and that with this I will close the circle with which I start my contribution to the book. The close, uh, it closes the, the circle because we still have a colonialist situation in Israel and Palestine. And it's very difficult in the 21st century to relate to a phenomenon that actually belongs to the late 19th century. And that's why there's a mismatch in our language, there is a mismatch in our conceptions of what the conflict is about and what is the solution. And that's why we are so, we are so pressed, hard pressed, to find the right definitions for... Uh, Sorry. You mean they haven't heard any word I said? <laughs> that's, that's, that's frightening. That's frightening to think about that. Um, we, we are hard-pressed to, um, uh, uh, to find uh, uh, the, the, the right dictionary and language for, for the solution itself. But I think that uh, uh, when people talk about the two-state solution, they re disregard the colonialist nature of the Zionist project, not only in the past, but also, also in the present, and I think are not engaged with the dangers of the next stages of the Zionization of Palestine. The project is not over yet. It's not completed yet. Uh, and, and, uh, and the mindset in Israel is that actually nothing stands in the way uh, of Israel as a state and a society towards a successful completion of that project. Uh, because in the West Bank there is no conflict anymore, and the kind of conflicts that Israel has in Gaza and in Lebanon are not part of the story of Palestine, they are part of the story of the global war against terrorism, and therefore uh, this story is over. 
and, and this is also a society that has a very, uh, uh, re relatively has a very convenient economic uh, 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 reality, or lives in a very convenient economic reality compared to many sections in the Western world in the last two or three years. So, so there is a real danger there. And I think that when you talk about the two states, you are, it's a sidebar to the main issue. It really is the sidebar to the main issue. You are un, uh, maybe unintentionally um, miss the, 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 the essence of the conflict. And you're dealing, if you want, in terms of medical terms, you're dealing with the symptoms and not with the illness uh, itself. And, and any thinking on the one state solution, whether it's very serious, where, whether it's a bit superficial, whether it is done by a group of academics, and we, as we have done in SOAS in London and in the Madrid conference, uh, the one you haven't heard about, uh, and um, or whether we're doing it in, in a more uh, uh, relaxed way, any such departure point brings us back to the essence, I think, I believe, in the essence of the problem. So, in fact, I don't think that the people who, wrote, who write today with the one-state solution have yet found the blueprint, as I call my article there, uh, the, the ideal blueprint for how would the post-Zionist, if you want, the post-Israel kind of state would look like. Um, the various conflicting models, bi-national models, democratic models, so on. But I think that's not the issue. What they are doing is, actually, is less the prognosis. I think they're highlighting the analysis vis-a-vis -vis an issue that at least allegedly has been analyzed to death. So you can ask, why do you need another analysis? I mean, go to any bookshop, uh, uh, browse any library in the university, and the number of books that explain the conflict, its origins, and so on, are so many. And, and one doesn't want to say that they are all useless. They are not. They are not. But I think there is something about deba the debate, or uh, something about the energy that I feel uh, uh, that is sipping through uh, 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 conferences like the one that was in Dallas uh, uh, a month ago and before that in London and in Stuttgart in Germany about the one-state solution and a very successful conference in Haifa uh, for the one-state solution. Something about that energy uh, shows you, and with this I would end, um, shows you that regardless of how well informed you are and how experienced you are or how long have you been involved in the Palestine issue. And regardless of what function or position you hold in that struggle for justice and peace in Palestine, there is a sense that uh, the existing paradigms do not work. Neither the paradigms that explain what's going on, nor the solutions. And I think the energy that I'm feeling, for, especially from the younger generation, is uh, to bring forth some old ideas, because the one state idea is an old idea, bring old some old ideas and close them, don them, don them with new closing, more uh, updated closing, and fit them to the 21st uh, century, and, and more important than anything else, locate them within the wider mode of action that seems to, to complement the struggle on the ground, the steadfastness of the people in the occupied territories, the people who struggle daily against the segregation wall, against the robbing of water, against the arrests, against the strangulation of Gaza, to complement it in a way that makes sense, not by uh, volunteering to go and fight for the Palestinians in Palestine, but by pushing forward a, a, a delegitimization, even, in a way, of a, of a regime with a sense that what you want instead is beneficial and good for everyone concerned, Jews and Palestinians alike. And I think that however difficult something, this is uh, uh, an issue to push forward because of the automatic accusation of anti-Semitism, uh, self-hating Jews, and so on, um, I think that uh, uh, one should disregard these accusations and push forward because uh, the stronger these accusations are being made, it seems that we, ha we are hitting the nail on its head. And that's a very good reason uh, to continue. I think I'll end here. Thank you.
got some good time for uh, <laughs> comments and questions. I just ask people to be mindful that there's a lot of people here. So if you can be concise, it'll give a few more people a chance to speak uh, or ask their question before the evening's out. And then um, for us to stick around and continue uh, uh, after. I see a gentleman with glasses in the back row there. Yeah. Yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> um, we definitely differ, which is good. Uh, I think that uh, uh, when the Israelis are the only ministerial committee the Israelis have established against uh, developments uh, in the outside world that uh, refrain or, or uh, refer to Israel's image, the only ministerial committee the Israelis have ever established was in reaction to the boycott, even before the boycott started. I've never seen a non-event such as the boycott, uh, created so much fear and hysteria in Israel. So um, we have a different, probably, um, measure of judgment. I judge things according, but that's my limited Israeli background. I judge uh, things according to the Israeli hysteria, barometer of hysteria, to judge whether we are effective or not. And I, so I don't know what your master plan is, but I haven't heard the Israelis being worried about your idea to bring down America. Uh, but I do know that the Israelis are a bit worried about uh, what happens to Israeli uh, academic institutes and culture. So until I would be proved, I, I will see proof that this is not creating fears in Israel and it is not triggering a debate in Israel, which it does, uh, I would continue to support it. Um, uh, so, so we differ here, and but uh, of course, the, as I said about, I said it before about boycott. This is these are issues where we should continue to to talk about, uh, but we need a bottom line. We need a bottom line. And secondly, I think you are underestimating the power of galvanization and 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 power of uh, an empowerment that the boycott issue has contributed to the Palestinian society on the ground. Uh, this was the only alternative people found for suicide bombing as in order to try and, and show resentment to the Israelis. So I think it has a non-violent element to it, which I haven't mentioned, which I think has to be accounted. And not everything in this world can be judged by an assured result, uh, because our lifespan is such that in the case of Israel and Palestine, most of these things would be witnessed, hopefully, by our grand-grandchildren. So we have to, to be modest about that. Uh, the worker state and so on, I come back to the issue. I. I I, I fully support this agenda and so on, but I really think that we have to be more savvy strategically on the Palestine issue. And if it would be only a socialist agenda, we tried that before, it doesn't work. And I'm saying this, I want to stress again why I'm saying this. I'm saying this because I think you may underestimate what the Israelis are planning in the next stages. And that's why you need a far more pragmatic kind of alliance of people and forces and even ideologies in order to stop the Israelis, even if it offends your more universal visions of a better world. Uh, okay, right here in the right. Repeat it anyway. I repeat it anyway. <laughs> Where do the, uh, the, the struggle against the military occupation on the ground and the flotilla a movement, so to speak, uh, fit into this uh, general strategy. I, I limited my analysis to things that we discuss uh, uh, in the book. Uh, uh, def uh, on the flotilla, I start with the flotilla, it's easier. I, I come now from a, a, a conference in Stuttgart, in Germany, with uh, a, a, among the participants was Haidar Eid from Gaza, uh, who was a strong believer in secular democratic state, a very brave man that only and uh, now, after five years, succeed in getting out of Gaza. And I think that if he says, and that's what he said, that we in Gaza want a tsunami of flotilla, who am I to say anything else about that? Uh, that's about that. And, and probably, if, I think he represents something that the people of Gaza feel, and, and, and definitely. Um, I think similar, uh, who can be against the, the popular committees in their very uh, brave struggle against the... the uh, construction of the wall against the demolition of houses in Silwan and Abu Dis and so on. Uh, I'm trying, I think, to have sort of a larger picture. And, and uh, I think one of the main problems, and I realize it, that because the Zionist movement, later Israel, fragmented the Palestinians, 
in such a way at every given moment in history there is more than one Palestinian group that deserves our attention that is suffering from a direct Israeli abuse and uh, we should be very careful not to do in a hierarchy of saying this group in Gaza is more important than the Palestinians in the Nakab uh, who, who are suffering now from an Israeli oppressive policy or from the people in Silwan that are being chucked out of their village. Um, the thing that we can do is to have a more coherent strategy rather than support that or other particular uh, action on the ground and, and I feel that there is a division of labor here and I, I don't know, I'm still not convinced that there's anything else that people here in New York can do apart from making Israelis uncomfortable here and I think that's very good if you can do this and, uh, and I don't think you can participate in the dialogue on the ground for a different kind of reality between Israelis and Palestinians. They would have to do it. Uh, although I know that some Jews in, in New York feel that they are part of that reality as well. I, I'm here to tell them that I exclude them from that uh, community. <laughs> I don't want any, sh any one of them to share with me the land of Israel. <laughs> and I want every one of my Palestinian friends in Nazareth to share with me the land of Israel. So they are not welcome. And, and, uh, but they are welcome to help me to build this uh, joint future together. And I think that's what I mean by that. Okay, a lot of hands. I'm going to go from a little younger. We haven't had a younger. Yeah, right there in the back of the <laughs> kind of. <laughs> It's a, it's a fair, and I repeat the question, it's a fair question to say that uh, even a small Palestinian state is better than the reality on the ground because it, uh, maybe it defeats the Zionist uh, and the Israeli policies. I'm very worried, for example, I, I'm not at all excited by the unilateral recognition by Argentina and Brazil of the PA. I think there's a danger that you will perpetuate a Bantustan on the ground and it would be even more difficult to convince people that this is occupation by other means. Uh, therefore, I, I, I think that uh, this strategy that I can see its logic before is a very dangerous one today. And rather than assuring the Palestinians a sovereign place or a small sovereign place, it would uh, perpetuate the new kind of ethnic cleansing that Israel exercises. Ethnic cleansing is not just about kicking people out. You can <coughs> imprison them in Gaza. You can bantustan them in, in Samaria, or as they call it, uh, in, in Israel, and that is the northern part of, of the West Bank. And you can uh, uh, put them in and enclave them in ghettos in the greater Jerusalem area. And then you don't care if these little enclaves call themselves a state and even if the rest of the world recognizes them. So I think this is a very dangerous strategy, at least to my mind. To materialize. Yeah, thank you. The first question is, how can I separate the struggle against uh, American imperialism and uh, Palestinian independence? I see we have some veterans in the successful struggle against American imperialism here. Um, we don't have time to wait for your successful struggle, sir. Uh, you, lo you look very young, and I'm, I'm sure you have another 100 years of struggle. Judging by your success until now, I think if I would rely on your chances for success in the next 100 years, Palestine would be erased from the map. And I don't have time for this. And uh, secondly, I do think on this issue that I'm not sure that when you say American imperialism, Similarly, as when you say European policy, the political elites take on Israel and Palestine necessarily, necessarily reflects what people feel. In fact, I think this is more, as much as it may be a struggle against American imperialism, which I think is the old language, we should now think for something new, uh, I think that there is um, a struggle about democracy. Definitely in Europe, the political elites do not reflect what the majority of people in Europe, at least in Western Europe, want them to do on the issue of Israel and Palestine. This is the most undemocratic thing that happens in Europe today. 
not in the new countries in Europe, you know, Czechoslovakia and Poland. The more anti-Semitic the country used to be, the more pro-Israeli it is. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, now, maybe America falls into the same category. I don't know. Uh, you have to check it out. You have to check it out. But I do think that democratically among an America, democracy in America, as, as you know, I'm, 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 I'm very modest. I'm trying to be very modest. I'm, I'm, I don't visit here often enough. But I have a feeling that very few sections of the American society play in the democratic game, all in all. Among those who play in the game, I think that, again, the, the balance of power between those who support the Palestinians uh, uh, and those who are against them is not reflected in the administration uh, policies. And, and I think I would work more on that. Uh, uh, but if you succeed with the other plan, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, the, um, you write about the two-state solution. I think definitely the vast majority of Israelis uh, would not support a one-state solution. The vast majority of white South Africans did not support the end of apartheid. That doesn't deter me. I'm not, uh, I don't think I can wait for the Israelis to deprogram themselves uh, uh, for that to happen. I would li rather kick them on the head and hope that somehow the disc would fall out of their mouths and there would be a new Israeli. I'd rather, I believe in this much more than, than in deprogramming uh, because it takes too long. And, and secondly, for the Palestinians, I think that you're talking about the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. You're not talking about the Palestinians inside Israel. You're not talking about the Palestinian refugees. And even among the Palestinians in the occupied territories now, there is a very different mood. I don't think it translated as yet into uh, surveys and so on, but I think it is there. Finally, on this point, as an activist, I see myself not someone who has to reflect the wish of the many, but I, I believe that I have also a role to say to people, I think you're wrong even if you are Palestinians, uh, and, uh, or even if you live under occupation. I can think that your strategy is not working. Uh, of course, it's up to them to decide eventually whether they want it. And uh, I would not uh, 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 build an army of volunteers to undermine the sovereign, independent Palestinian state next to Israel should it come into being. I doubt very much if this is what the Israelis want either. The Israelis don't want the one-state solution. They don't want a two-state solution. They want the Israeli Republic to continue to be a racist state that has, controls all of Palestine with various kinds of legal regimes. And it hopes that the world would allow this impunity to go on without, with, them, with immunity forever. Uh, yeah, the Kathia, the black coat, the back. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree. I think that the, the, the notion of academic boycott is very problematic and, and, and at least on the face of it goes against the idea of academic freedom and so on. Um, I think that now, after years of debating with myself on this, at least I have a coherent position on this and uh, I don't know exactly how to put it forward. Um, one thing I would say, when I called for an academic boycott back in Israel in 2002, for instance, uh, very few people supported it. I remember that with the late Tanya Reinhardt, we composed a list of six people who, who supported from within the Israeli academia, the academic boycott. The two of them, I think, were not alive even. One of them, Daniel Amit, I don't know when that was the last time he saw Israel. And another one, I would have never included her in an academic uh, list, but that doesn't matter. And nowadays, I think you have even a committee for academic boycott on Israel inside the Israeli academia. So I think the idea, instead of alienating Israeli academics, is, is, is accepted by people who, who are, are even part of that academia. Uh, the second thing, I think that it took some time for this movement to clarify the difference between institutional boycott and individual boycott. And I think we have to be very clear on this. We have to to, to stick to institutional uh, boycott, because I think individual boycott leads to very bad things, kind of a McCarthy movement that will decide who can come and who cannot come. Uh, and even there, we haven't yet, I think, fully articulated this distinction in a clear way, but we are getting there. I think we are getting there. If you look at the uh, Pakavi uh, website, I think you will see that uh, these things are now more clear than they were before. And I think that uh, you're right. Uh, more than anything else, the debate sometimes is more important whether your college or school uh, uh, 
boycotts Israeli academia or not, the fact that there is a debate means that uh, you, uh, you are, in my mind, obtaining the main objective of this campaign, which is to question the legitimacy of what Israel is doing through an academic boycott. It could be done in other ways as well. So, so I feel that um, what cannot be questioned is the validity. Now, on top of it, we are still in need, and I hope we will provide it very soon in Bakbi and so on, for a very good research on the culpability of the Israeli Academy. I mean, how far goes the Israeli academic involvement in, in maintaining the occupation, in facilitating the occupation? We all know, uh, in general, that it is there, but we need, I think, to prove it. We need a very kind of Noam Chomsky kind of work, very pedantic, very, very comprehensive, and, and show how far this, this kind of co cooperation goes. Uh, uh, and, and finally, we should never forget how still the Israeli academia as an institute is silent vis-a-vis uh, -vis the way that the Israelis are treating the Palestinian academic institutions. This by itself is enough to think seriously about the academic boycott of Israel. Thank you for, for your comments. Uh, about your question, um, I, I, I think what we, uh, we are trying to do, I mean, those of us who are involved in this idea uh, uh, of the one-state uh, solution is to tell ourselves that unfortunately we have a lot of time. And because we have a lot of time, we can uh, more in a more, more relaxed way try to figure out certain things which uh, may come handy later on uh, if this kind of, these kinds of ideas would be more accept, widely accepted and would be part of uh, an agenda of a political movement. So it's time to, to think about uh, constitutions, uh, uh, joint uh, educational programs. I mean, from the more the mo most practical level of joint life to the more uh, sort of grand ideas uh, surrounding ideas of, of sovereignty, identity, um, and unlike the Libyan ruler, leave the question of the name to to the, the to the uh, moment of celebration, not to start with. <laughs> uh, so, so I think that that's what we're trying uh, to do, and I'm I'm glad to say that this is a great group of people that grows by the day, uh, uh, as long as it remembers that it is not a representative group. Because the issue of representation is the most important issue on the Palestinian agenda now, which nobody can interfere in, I think. And we need, we need a closure there on the representative issue, or representation issue. But we can work on it while this is done uh, in, 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 a similar, in a similar way. So, so I, I, I think that's... that's um, more or less where, where we are uh, today uh, in, this, in, the, in this idea. And um, it's, uh, it's not even a good agenda, I think, for activism necessarily as such. It's more, it's more uh, um, a platform for contemplating and, and sort of figuring out things, which sometimes is contradictory to activism, and, uh, but sometimes is missing from activism. So I think that's where we are. Sorry, right. you served right over there. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you see, the first point uh, about the dominant narrative of anti Semitism and how uh, uh, one has to incur it and include it into, in the, the very sort of forceful dialogue you have with the Israelis if you come from the departure point of boycott. Um, I, I really think that telling people I will boycott your institutions if these policies continue is a dialogue. I don't think it's a punishment. I think it's a dialogue. It, 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 it confines the boundaries which I allow myself morally, in which, in which in morally I can find myself uh, active. In other words, I, I think that um, uh, the, the idea is, is almost in a simplistic way to say we don't think that people are evil but systems can be evil. And, and, uh, and, and there is certain things that can be done against systems uh, that uh, would affect people who are part of that system if they are not, do, do not recognize the evil system they work in. It's not only true about uh, Israel, as you know. And, and, uh, and I think that you're right. That should be part of the dialogue. Uh, however, I feel that uh, uh, the, to connect it that we, as activists, would connect it to the issue of anti-Semitism, would play into the hands of those who demonize us. And I don't think we have to do this. 
I, I insist in all my talks, especially in places like Germany and Italy where people, as I said to you, when countries have an anti-Semitic history, they are the most, uh, so the greatest supporters of Israel. And in these countries, when people give me this spiel of, of anti-Semitism, <laughs> I tell them, you know, invite me next week. I will participate in a rally against anti-Semitism. I would even give a lecture about the, the pearls of anti-Semitism. I'm sorry, this is not about anti-Semitism tonight. Only in an in, in indirect way that Zionism was definitely a genuine response to anti-Semitism. But uh, as far as the Palestinians are concerned, any attempt to convince them that this is their problem is the root of the problem of Israel and Palestine. I, I want to divorce the issue of anti-Semitism from Zionism today as a settler colonialist movement. The settler colonialist movement of Zionism today, if anything creates more anti-Semitism, doesn't solve the problem of anti-Semitism, and definitely is bad news to the Palestinians from A to Z. So uh, it doesn't work anymore. Um, you know, I, I hate to, I don't think we need to do too many comparisons with, with Nazism and so on. Uh, I, I don't think they're helpful. I, I think it's, it's, it's good enough, I think it's good enough to locate the Israeli uh, uh, policies of the future within a better understanding of the Israeli mindset. And I don't know, I mean, it would be academically interesting to compare it, for example, if you want, to the policies uh, uh, against the Armenians and so on. But I think what we need is a bet as activists rather than academics uh, of a good understanding of how far can this mindset go. We, we, we understand that Gaza is not the worst, right? We understand that the daily abuses of Palestinian life in the West Bank is not the worst we have seen. We understand that the policies against the Palestinians in the south of Israel is not the worst. So worst can come. And, and uh, we have to alert others to that kind of a scenario. Uh, without, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 using too many uh, uh, historical comparisons which are inept and stressing those which are apt. And to my mind, the South African comparison is powerful, inspirational, and, and very uh, accurate. That, that, that is uh, my feeling. And I'm trying to figure out what was your last point. Non-violence. Oh, non-violence. Thank you. Um, I'm... I find myself difficult in answering questions like this. I mean, I know what my own personal position is. I would like to believe that I, I, I'm, I'm a pacifist by heart, that uh, I would try and avoid violence whenever I can on a daily basis, that is, on an individual basis, and also as a, pol as a political option. However, I don't want to be too sterile on this. When, when someone comes for, for the fifth time to destroy my village, I don't want to send him a message. If someone is suffering, I'm sorry, a fifth visit by the Israeli tanks that demolishes their houses, I don't want to send them a message from New York saying, keep on the nonviolence. We support you. I don't know. I don't want to do this. Uh, however, I do think that the BDS, for instance, is a nonviolent option, effective one that works, and uh, uh, hopefully would make other means of struggle against colonization, occupation, ethnic cleansing, less necessary. But I don't want to pass the uh, moral judgment about, uh, I don't know how, if you have ever visited the West Bank, but what these people are suffering, or what the people of Gaza are suffering, to ask them to be Quakers in such situation, <laughs> I don't know, I find it a bit too much. Thank you. Two last questions. I'm going to apologize right now. I know there's a lot of people in this room who have questions, but this is also going to allow time for people to get books in the back, come up, and uh, have a few seconds. Uh, Ilan will stick around for a little bit longer, but he's we've been wearing him very thin. He's been coming all around the country. He's just come through three states and was up at four this morning to get back here uh, to New York. So uh, right there in the blue sweater. Strategies against Christian Zionism. Uh, I, I know of groups, I don't, I'm a bit tired now, so I don't remember the names, but I know that there are alternative pilgrims, pilgrims tours into, to, to, to Israel and to the occupied territories by uh, Christian groups uh, around the world that uh, um, visit the holy places without turning the people into ambassadors and ambassadors uh, of Israel. So I think that 
that's one good idea that comes to my mind. Uh, I don't know if I have anything better to say this. I, I, I really think that humor, they're so ridiculous. I think, I don't know, <laughs> a, recruit John Stewart, uh, I don't know, some more reasonable, funny people you have. You don't have that many in America, but you know, if you have enough funny people around here, and if you know, we'll ship you some from England. We have plenty of those. Uh, uh, and, and recruit them. I, I think this is one of the most pathetic, ridiculous human phenomenon. Uh, is it, it's worse than McDonald's. I mean, I, it's, it's, I'm sure we can, we can ridicule them uh, uh, and, and try to, to and, and as, as Christians, as devout Christians, we should ridicule them. It, it's contrary, I think, to Christianity and so on. So, but again, I'm, 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 I, I think there are better people who, uh, who wrote excellent book, uh, Stephen Caesar, Caesar? Caesar. Stephen Caesar, uh, God, I won't try to say Norton's family name. Mzvinsky? Uh, Mzvinsky. Uh, the excellent books, and I think these books uh, are, uh, for me, guided me in both understanding the phenomenon and also thinking of how to confront it. Thank you. Someone, but uh, away in the back of the white shirt. <laughs> no, I think uh, Zionism is a very unique case of settler colonialism. So, so fighting against it uh, demands much more than fighting against uh, settler colonialism or colonialism in, in Africa and elsewhere. So I think that that's to begin with is the main problem. That this was a very different kind of group of colonialists. Uh, you know, the early Zionist settlers uh, regarded the Palestinians even when they still needed the Palestinians as hosts and people who would teach them how to cultivate the land, they regarded them as hostile aliens. Uh, most classical colonialist movements n did not regard uh, uh, colonia uh, the native population as aliens. So there, there was a, something unique. And of course the, the basic background of a group that had nowhere to go back is very important in this respect of in, in, in explaining the invincibility in many ways and the steadfastness of the settler colonialist society. So the Palestinians uh, uh, were asked to be a super anti-colonialist movement. And, you know, to their credit, they're normal people. They're not great anti-colonialists. That's why I like them. They're not great anti-colonialists and they're facing the most difficult kind of a colonialist challenge. If you will ask me the basic I may be wrong there because I haven't done a research on this. But I think that the, the basic Palestinian impulse is for normal life. That's not good for an anti-colonialist movement. You have to strive to something far more. But I'm so glad that I'm not striving for something for some more. So I think that's the main, uh, apart from you right, the special American support and so on. But I think it really is, I mean, everybody who lives in Israel, I think understand it, uh, uh, the, the mismatch, the gap between what the Palestinians want to achieve, sometimes on a very local level, and the grand strategy that Zionism represents. And uh, that's very difficult, apart from the military. I don't remember such military imbalances in the history of colonialism either, between the strongest military power in the Middle East and the weakest military group in the Middle East. So I think the all kinds of things. However, because of that complex history and what I said before, the wish to create a democracy, maybe a wish to become part of the democratic world because of the uniqueness of the Jewish problem that created the Zionist movement. Because of all that, maybe you, there is a, a chance for a success which does not have to be modeled exactly on the other anti-colonialist uh, movement, uh, apart from South Africa, which I think is a better example. And even the end result of the colonialist struggles in the Arab world and in Africa, also not something to aspire to between me and you. I mean, would you like the Palestinians to have modern-day Egypt, modern-day Algeria, modern-day Somalia? We should all aspire to something better as Arabs and as Jews who live in the Middle East. Thank you.
I doubt very much if this is what the Israelis want either. The Israelis don't want the one-state solution. They don't want the two-state solution. They want the Israeli Republic to continue to be a racist state that has, controls all of Palestine with various kinds of legal regimes. And it hopes that the world would allow this impunity to go on without, with, with immunity forever.